The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. But what of these modern times of connectivity, with the ease of piecing together of disassociated knowledge, can any information be safely sequestered away, fragmented and separated, never to come together and burrow in the minds of men? My knowledge of such things began in the time of yore, almost time immemorable, during my tenure at Initech. It was where I discovered the madness that lurks in my mind, my soul, my dreams, even to this day. The madness, I pray, that can be excised with this story, that through writing these words, I may achieve from the catharsis and perhaps at least peace. I was a technician at Initech. At first a lowly one, but then increasingly senior as the company saw greater and greater success. The company grew larger, its tendrils hungry to feed off more. It drew in more resources, more people, each more diverse than the last, in both personality and physical location. Entire companies were joined to Initech by way of merger and acquisition. Initech's infrastructure grew in lockstep. Servers were purchased, remote locations came online, and the catalyst of this fateful tale, an alliance with IBM. In an amount of time far swifter than the humble technician like me was ever used to, a wave of blue change swept through Initech. But suffice to say, everything became IBM. Initech's ERP was changed and now ran on AIX, the blue giant's own flavor of Unix. With the changes done, Initech turned its new infrastructure and capabilities on Minitech, a large competitor, and swooped upon it to perform the inevitable and unavoidable acquisition. But while the leaders and scholars of Initech were looking out, technicians such as I were looking in. In those tumultuous days, with so many of our people being remote, but all of our resources being centralized, remote consoles were the only way to bring both together. Employees connected to the ERP software via Telnet and using the corn shell. Occasionally, well, far more often than the world would imply, something would go haywire with the dial-up connection. 
the modem would misbehave, the phone line would be too noisy, or perhaps just fate would intervene in its mysterious ways. The connection would be assaulted with electrical noise, spraying the current working directory with an acidic wash of random ASCII. By methods and designs beyond my ken, would wander too close to a cat command and end up in the wrong side of a pipe. It was on the eve of the acquisition of Minitech when I looked too far inwards with only the best of intentions. I wanted to welcome our new Minitech brethren to a system that was not littered with these abominations that lay foul to our ERP. These malformed files had always been a horror I tried to see only in my periphery. Something I acknowledged existed but did everything in my conscious power to avoid interacting with. But I was interacting with systems during the merging, and these things were ubiquitous. Pieces of madness strewn about, like little things, like motes in the corner of your eye. Tiny, unnoticed, until they're noticed. Then you cannot unsee them. I was driven, but I did not know how to excise these devils. How can you drive away that which you cannot even address directly? So in my thrice damned cleverness, I devised a workaround. One that could only be born somewhere in the continuum of the youthful bravado and outright insanity. Before this incident, I could excuse my behavior as the former, but afterwards, I could only dare to hope to escape from the latter, which I know pulls at my hindbrain even to this day. I could not refer to those modern noise files directly by name, but through the wonders of scripting, I could enumerate the extent of respectably named files in a directory. With arrogant keystrokes, I created a script that created a temporary folder elsewhere, and it tucks away all the proper files into that encompassing safety of its embrace. And then, in a single fell swoop, banish the malformed miscreants into the ether with a single rm star command. I ran my precious foolish script on a directory or two, and it worked a wonder. The directories at long last were pure and clean, swept free like a warm, sweet wind lifting the heavy, lung-scalding smog from the valley. It worked well, and I congratulated myself. But, oh, hubris. I knew cleaning a few personal directories would not be enough. There was an entire file system that, over the many epochs of time, had been defiled upon by foulness. It was everywhere, and at last I could fix it. I unleashed my script like the furious right hand of the archangels themselves. Directory after directory expunged, and it worked perfectly everywhere. Everywhere, that is, until I discovered modem noise files in the root directory. In a hazy stupor, like being drunk on the power I wielded, I turned my script on the root directory and unleashed it. I never made it past the first step, though. Perhaps a small part of my brain realized only after the command had been executed what the connotations of what I'd done were. Surely, dear listener, as a experienced Unix system admin, you can probably already feel the horror that only dawned on me like a rising tide. My terminal froze, locked up with a sudden bone-jarring stop. A chilling realization emerged in me and became clearer with each flashing of the pulsing, yet now lifeless, cursor. The server must have been using those files. In the glow of only the infernal, useless terminal and the midnight moon streaming into the office, I nearly wept. That this could happen was impossible. It must have been a simple glitch, not unlike those line hiccups that had caused those demon files in the first place, but my terminal did not reboot. I was overcome with near mortal anguish. 
The visions of thousands of users lost adrift, disconnected for eternity, all because of me. Surely there was backups. Someone could undo this conflagration. But no, none of my fevered ramblings would come to pass. The server was dead, killed by my own folly. There was not to be done but travel back to my residence and spend the night in the sleepless fits that a man wrought with guilt should suffer. And suffer I did. Never had six hours stretched themselves into an eternity with no horizon before my eyes. Without knowing the warm comfort of sleep, I returned to the office at a time early enough to know that I'd be the first one in. A shamble of a man, lumbering back to the scene of his horrors. I should be at the front door, personally meeting the face of every employee whose day I had destroyed. Would I greet them apologetic, a meek smile on my face to mask my dread, prostrate myself on the sidewalk before them, the concrete as cracked and trod upon as I felt? A small blessing in disguise awaited for me in the break room. Marie, the project manager, the system controller, was by the coffee machine, slowly savoring her morning libation. It meant she hadn't yet discovered the fatal deviation I had thrust upon the server. If she had, she would not be enjoying herself as such. Without a word, we marched into her office. She tried to log into the machine from her terminal, a vain attempt for sure, but I could not blame her for wanting to verify my folly herself. Marie was silent for a moment. Each time her nostrils flared or her lips parted for breath, I recoiled, knowing a vicious but well-deserved berating will burst from her at any moment. But it never came. Instead, she opened a drawer that has not been opened in time immemorable and retrieved a key unlike any I had ever seen. It was oddly shaped. Tiny spikes and spokes protruded from it at odd angles. Even though the key was ancient, it was not tarnished. It's a key to the server itself, Marie told me, only to be used in the direst of emergencies. Together we traveled to the server room. We passed the steady stream of arriving employees. We went through a door I'd never been through, and down a flight of stairs I barely knew existed. The temperature had noticeably dropped. In the dimly lit concrete hallway that ran the length of the building, I could almost see my breath escaping from my mouth like a vagrant soul trying to rend its way from this place. This leads to the server room, she told me, which was odd because I thought the servers were housed upstairs in the tech room. But no, I was mistaken. This was the server room specified and equipped by IBM. This was the AIX server room. It was where the ERP itself resided. Separate from the email servers, from the web servers, and from all the other infrastructure I had physically touched. Boxes that looked like nothing I had ever laid my eyes upon. Reams of wiring dipped and swooped to and fro and in and out of places obscured by shadow. None of them were the same. RJ45, Ethernet... Well, was that a token ring, Terminator? How ancient were these connections? And beyond all the bewildering whirl of technology, a single box sat on a desk like a steel dais enclosed with a cage of metal to keep the box safe, or perhaps to keep people safe from the box. Marie inserted the strange key into the receptacle. She turned it, and a new sound filled the air, and it was rising. Something coming to life, if life is how you dare describe it, this shambling thing that was merely a hollow shell of what it once was. The built-in monitor glowed. The server pulled a maintenance shell from behind comprehension, from beyond user space, and projected it onto the screen. Marie laid her fingers on the keyboard. It was a direct connection to the soul of the entire system. Will this work? I dared ask. I hope so, she said quietly, her fingertips twitching. Or else I'll have to call... Her voice trailed off. She typed a command, and the system told her it couldn't be found. That, that cannot be, Marie said, staring at the incomprehensible and impossible error message. That command she types shouldn't be missing. 
It was a standard command known by all, repeated by all, and the colonel since the earliest recorded epoch, maybe even before. It was part of the system, the system I had sliced into pieces and scattered. Ugh. I spoke about the temporary directory. Look there for the commands. I can't, she replied. It is not found. It can't simply be gone. The LS command must exist. Unless... No, I couldn't think of it. I refused to acknowledge that thought that gnawed at me. To think of what I'd done. To think of why I'd done it. How I'd done it. I couldn't address those modem files directly, only indirectly by inference. Why could it not be done that way again? Does CP exist? I asked. She typed so slowly, fearfully. Tap, tap, thunk. Silence, and then yes. A single word, but a rush of hope beyond comprehension. As deep as we were in the mouth of madness, a single solitary word of hope had been uttered and it was louder than any cacophony of cooling fans. We can do this, I said. The commands aren't missing, they're just relocated beyond the veil of normal directory structure. But I know where they are, in limbo, and we can pluck them back, put them back where they belong, try system commands one at a time, and if they fail, we can restore them one at a time with CP. I hope so, Maria said again and typed. The first command copied, then the second, and a third. One by one, we identified the commands, pulled them from the temporary void, and restored them. After an hour, we had pulled the server back from the brink of death and restored a functional operating system. Barely functional, perhaps I should only describe it as, at best, stabilized. The commands worked, but not as expected. Interactions were off. Permissions were not correct. And that silver hope, just like that, was extinguished under a burden of realization. We had restored the command structure of the server, but there were still files in the void of the temporary directory. An unknown portion of the server was still sequestered away, and the maintenance shell simply could not put them back into place properly, even if either of us knew how. It's over, I said, defeated. But for some reason, Marie wasn't. No, it isn't, she said, a wicked grin on her manic face. How could she be pleased? Had the overwhelming burden of what had fallen upon us broken her at last? They can work with this. I know they can. They, I said, confused as Marie pushed past me. Who are they? She picked up a dusty, wired phone and phoned the number pasted on the wall. She turned and finally answered me. IBM, support. She spoke into the phone, at first in English, but then slowly slipping into tongues I did not comprehend. Acronyms. Chains of words that should be familiar but lost their meanings when put in the order she did. I could not understand Marie, but I could read her body language. Apprehensive and pensive hope. I wish I could share any of those feelings, but this place was getting to me. The blinking lights, the dark shadows, machines that may or may not be doing their job the central heart and soul of it all limping along the fine line between life and death. We barely spoke at all. What did we have to talk about? What did we dare say out loud in this place? Soon enough, think any deity who would hear me, they arrived. Men in gray suits, decorated with in a text various of very important person visitor tags. The ancient handlers arrived. Those who brought their tomes and their incantations and rituals, and their price. It would be steep, non-negotiable. They set up around the server, briefcase full of keys like Marie's, but stranger. Wires and ends like gaping maws of no shape I had ever seen. Terminals that were like in a tech's own, but only on the surface. And before they began, they shoot us out of the server room, like a cult that held onto their secrets.
I do not know what went on in that basement, and for the sake of whatever sanity I have left to this day, I do not want to know. The system was dragged back from the brink, piece by piece, into a patchwork. By the end of the day, terminals flared back to some imitation of life. I never saw the strange men from IBM leave, but by the time I dared go back to the office, they were gone. The server was up once again, accepting terminal connections. It reached out to the world and let the world reach into it. It was a server once more. On the surface, the system looked normal, but I had seen into the deep. Even now, I could see the patchwork, the scars, the artifacts of what had risen. Though this system ostensibly worked, eternal and irrevocable evidence of the madness remained. I could never be confident that some random glitch was not related to the great awakening of chaos. Initech moved on from the incident and brought Minitech into the fold and several other companies since. Management always talks of replacing the ERP system and the AIX server that hosts it. But that project, like all corporate projects, was always six months away from completion. No one delved into the details of this incident. Even Marie took the knowledge of the madness with her when she left in attack shortly thereafter. And thus, no single person had complete knowledge of what happened, nor the means to piece it together. No one knew the full extent of what transpired that fateful and horrible day. No one but for myself. I have gathered together all evidence and documents I could find of the incident, the flood of ticket requests from the day, work orders from IBM cultists who faced down the thing, Marie's incomplete postmortem, the seemingly random spattering of bug reports that trickled in even to this day. I put it all on this USB stick. With it shall go to this blog of mine, this test of my own sanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that ERP has told of horror, and even the satisfaction of system administration and the acquisition and adaptation of new technology must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my tenure at Inatech will be long. As Marie went, as so many poor technicians went, so I shall go. Let me pray that, if this blog outlasts me, my web administrators may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other web server. I know too much, and still, in its cage at the server room, the patchwork ERP waits dreaming. <laughs>